And so, welcome again to another CBAC Cardiac Biolacristi Seminar. And uh, I'm uh, happy, and I think we're all fortunate to have uh, Peter Schwartz with us today. Peter's been uh, a friend for many years now, I don't know how many, but many. And um, he uh, is a very distinguished uh, member of the cardiac electrophysiology community. Uh, Peter uh, is an MD, a clinician, but uh, the unique thing about Peter is that he really bridges the gap between the molecular level of what happens to ion channels, the genetics of, of mutations in ion channels, and the clinical phenotype and its treatment. And that's really a, a unique uh, situation to be here, to be in, and he has been pioneering that kind of uh, going from the molecule to the bedside. Uh, Peter is the uh, chairman of the Department of uh, Cardiology at the University of Pavia in Italy. Uh, another distinction because the University of Pavia, I think, is arguably the first university in Europe. I think, no? 12th Third. century or 30, 12th 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. 1235. 1235. I stand corrected. 1275. <laughs> anyway, it's older than Washington University in St. Louis. So, uh, <laughs> So, and it's beautiful. Those of you who haven't been there, it's really a place to visit. Beautiful style, cloister style university, the old style of how university used to be in Europe. So, without first ado, I will ask Peter to uh, tell us about the long QT syndrome. From Jean to that side. Well, thank you, Yoram, and uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here, and uh, I won't spend much time in generalities. I will certainly focus today on the impact that molecular biology has had on the management of the long QT syndrome. I will just uh, spend a few minutes uh, saying uh, a few words about generalities about the long QT syndrome because some of you may, of course, not be familiar with the disease. So um, uh, I've been told that there is a button that I should never press. And if I press it, oh, terrible things will happen to me. So of course, I'm totally <laughs> shaking any time I'm close to the button. Uh, okay. Now, um, this slide is simply to remind you that what we call long QT syndrome has two main entities. The one that everyone is familiar with is the romano wolf syndrome, which is in traditional long QT syndrome without reference. Uh, T is a much <coughs> less frequent uh, disorder, but was the very first one to have been published and described in 1957 by Professor Jeffrey. I'll showing it here because in a few moments, I'll show you some uh, totally new data of this form of long QT syndrome. And uh, uh, these data are still not yet published. They've just been accepted in the situation. Now, the long QT syndrome has uh, several features. And this is an old slide that uh, contains most of them. It is a genetically transmitted disorder. And we will see in, in a few moments what are the main genes. It manifests in young age. And most of the individuals who develop symptoms do so before age 20. The prolongation of the QT interval is, of course, the landmark of the disease. But as we will see, a number of these patients may have a normal QT interval. And this is creating a lot of problems from many points of view. But there is a reason for that. Uh, frequent syncope or cardiac arrest, especially during emotional or physical stress, <coughs> is another critical feature. These are the children uh, who faint or die suddenly, <coughs> uh, playing soccer, um, being frightened when they undergo questions at school, uh, uh, under any sort of physical or emotional condition. But we also learned over the years that some of these people may die suddenly during their sleep. And now we understand that this is due to the specific uh, genes involved. Finally, and most important, this is a disease in which there is a very high mortality among symptomatic and untreated patients. And we have a very effective therapy. Now, this is of paramount importance because it means that the existence of symptomatic patients without diagnosis is no longer acceptable. As a matter of fact, it is a bit sad that I wrote exactly the same words in 1975 in my first radiologist thing, and that's 30 years ago. And still now we're continuously confronted with patients in whom the diagnosis is made too late. 
In terms of diagnosis, uh, we did uh, publish in 1993 in circulation a set of quantitative criteria, but for practical purposes, uh, I believe that these other criteria are still uh, very useful. And one can make a diagnosis of long syndrome in the presence of, in the presence of either two major criteria or one major and minor. The major criteria, of course, are the prolongation of the acute interval, stress-induced syncope, and the family history of the long syndrome. Someone has to determine is already the diagnosis. The minor criteria are congenital deafness, as I mentioned earlier, fever voltiness, which is a very peculiar uh, alteration uh, um, of the electrocardiogram, which is associated with high electrical instability. Low heart rate in children is an important market, and what I call the typical repolarization abnormalities. And there are many types of them, but I will focus on one briefly. This is uh, actually one of the very first patients published by uh, Gervell. And as you see, these monstrous T waves, absolutely uh, 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 bizarre shapes. Uh, this is actually uncommon. This is not what you usually find. Um, but this is the kind of tracing that I wish to call your attention to because not only you have a prolongation of the QT interval, but as you see these arrows here, they point to these little notches that for a long time had escaped any att attention. They are probably representing early after polarizations, but importantly, they are very often a marker of the disease. I don't like uh, usually to show uh, anecdotes or examples, but I will show one clinical example. Um, this is something that happened to me about 10 years ago. I got a phone call from uh, uh, a, a woman living in northern Italy. She said that she lost her, her son at age 18 suddenly, and uh, she had a younger daughter. Someone had mentioned the possibility of the long syndrome, and they wanted to, to, to see it. So they came, and. Uh, sat down, mother, father, and this younger the girl, and I asked the mother to tell me the story of the boy who died. This was a story. It is a, he's a kid uh, who at uh, age 11 began to have syncope while playing soccer. Um, he continued to have syncope always during exercise, and at this point, epilepsy was suspected. Now, epilepsy is the most common misdiagnosis in this disease. It's not at all infrequent. Uh, that by error, these patients who faint may have convulsions under stressful conditions are told to have epilepsy. So, the neurologist was told that the neurologist dismissed epilepsy and was good enough to refer this kid to a pediatric cardiologist. Up to here, this is absolutely perfect. I think everyone did his job properly. So, since in that large city there is a big hospital with pediatric cardiology, the kid was taken there. They did uh, the usual thing, ECG, an echo, alter, everything was regarded as normal. Therefore, there was no treatment. Syncope continued to recur once, twice per year, always during exertion or stress. Uh, next year, at age 18, uh, he went for medical checkup for military service. But to no one's surprise, he was found healthy and ready to serve. And a few months later, while on a holiday with the family, he died suddenly swimming. <coughs> and uh, at this point, I did ask the mother to show me the electrocardiogram of, of this boy. <coughs> and even if I've shown this slide I mean, at least 50 times, every time I do it, I develop boost pumps because this is the CG. Now, as you see, not only the QTC was extremely long, I mean, the you normal know, upper value of of QTEs for 140 milliseconds, extremely long QT, but you see very clear the notches that I've shown to you earlier. There is no way in the world that is acceptable that especially pediatric cardiologists would miss the diagnosis. And this is happening all the time, everywhere in the world. Uh, this boy, they've been diagnosed, they've been treated with beta blockers, the probability is that 98% he would be alive today. So I'm showing this slide to you because if there are any physicians <coughs> in the room, this is something that should never be missed. Okay, let me move to therapy, and I have two slides just to show you what we do uh, at my place 
when we have patients of whom we don't know the genotype, which is what happens in reality when you see a patient for the first time, because it takes several months by the time you get the blood, send it to molecular lab and get uh, results back. It is true that at this point, I'm sorry, I'm going to be in your way here. So no, sorry, no, perhaps if you move over there, I can see. Uh, okay, good. That's but I'll, I'll, I may be moving into okay. there. Okay, I'll go like this. If you don't, if you don't care, <laughs> <laughs> if you care to see what I'm showing. Sure. <laughs> All right. And uh, in any case, uh, I was saying that uh, based on experience at this point, we can uh, uh, suppose what the genotype is even before testing. And probably eighty percent of the times I'm right. But of course, this is not the truth. So you do need the genotype. But again, as I said, the first time the patient comes in uh, and you don't know the genotype, if the patient, oops, if the patient is asymptomatic and or we think to be, then what we do is start with beta blockers and full dose. We use either propranolol or nadolol. If syncope recurs, which is true in 20-30% of the patients, then we proceed with left cardiac sympathetic generation in a 35-minute surgery through the neck and we take out the lower part of the left thoracic ganglion and the first three to four thoracic ganglion. We use mexilatin only if it is accompanied by mild QT shortening and uh, that as a matter of fact applies to one specific subtype of, of the patients. If these patients of a non-genotype present with cardiac arrest, independently of being or not being on therapy, first thing we do is we implant an ICD Next, we initiate or continue beta blockers, and then I perform sympathectomy in order to reduce the probability of an attack. Let's never forget that these patients, at variance with patients with ischemic disease, often may have storms. They have one shock, they release more catecholamines because of pain and fear, and they start being shocked a number of times. I had a German girl, age nine, who was shocked 122 times <coughs> in one day with the parents watching. Now, the ICD saved the life of the patient, but it's not preventing the shots. Sympathectomy does, so it's a very useful combination. All right, now let's shift gears. <coughs> I went through a, a bit of general things in terms of the long term syndrome from a clinical standpoint, and uh, let's now focus on uh, how has molecular biology impacted on the management. And the molecular biologists brought to us both conceptual and clinical implications. The first point uh, is uh, just a reminder. I mean, I don't like these type of slides, but uh, they are necessary in a sense. Uh, from, LQ, from LQT1 to LQT3, these are the major genes. The points I would like to make here is that all these genes encode for ion channels involved in the control of utilization. And those involved with potassium channels are loss of function in terms of the EP effect. Uh, those involving uh, sodium or calcium represent the gain of function. I listed here also the gervais langenitsa syndrome, the one type with congenital deafness, because this is due to mutations on two alleles. So the patients are either homozygous or compound heterozygous with mutations either on KCNQ1 which is the IKS, or on KCNE1, which we used to call mean K, which is a beta subunit. And the point here is that all the mutations lead to loss in IKS coverage. The reason to show and insist a little bit on the Gervel is because I'm going to show you now some of very recent findings that we have uh, just put in a circulation uh, um, a few weeks ago in the map that has been accepted. Uh, if you look in the literature for the gervais langenitz syndrome, you will realize that even though the first case was published in 1957, what you find is one family here, two patients there, essentially you find anecdotes. Uh, here we were able with uh, this rather large group of people to put together data of 186 of these patients. And this is allowing us to okay. draw some so five items I'm going to discuss now. And they involve genotype phenotype correlation, gene specific therapy, low penetrance, modifier genes. And I'll show you uh, what I think is the prevalence of this disease, which so far is unknown. And when I say is unknown, is that if you look in any textbook, you find that Lockheed syndrome is uh, one in 10,000. 
one in five thousand. And then if you ask the questions, what it is based on? It's based on nothing, zero. These are all assumptions that people have begun to make at one point. No one has the courage to challenge them, so they are pervading the literature without any shred of evidence. Uh, so since I like to talk based on data, I'll show you something that is giving us, I believe, a reasonable approximation of the true prevalence of this disorder. OK, for genotype phenotype correlation, it's important to develop a common language. And one impact of the, the, the molecular biology was that now we can no longer use the term long receiver, and we talk of LQT1 for the patients with mutations affecting IKS, LQT2 for the patients whose mutations affect the IKR current, and LQT3 if the sodium uh, current is involved. Now, IKS is a current that I like very much, and I like it also because it's the only current that allows me to teach molecular biology to my uh, four-year-old uh, grandchildren. Uh, and so I think I could be successful here as well. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that you all know about IKS, but in any case, IKS is uh, enhanced by catecholamines, becomes the predominant potassium current in conditions of high synthetic activity, and mutations on IKS impair QT shortening when heart rate increases. Now, that is the theory, is that real or not? Uh, this is just an example of uh, 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 well, let me backtrack for a second. In Italy, if anyone wants to do competitive sports, by law, they have to go through a cardiological exam. Otherwise, they won't. Uh, this, by the way, leads to the fact that the number of individuals who would like to compete and are found to have certain disorders are not allowed to compete. And this is the reason by which the percentage or the number of athletes dying suddenly in this country is five times higher compared to that in Italy. But I won't enter into that. Uh, here I'm just showing uh, this uh, young lady with a totally normal QT at rest. You can see of 427. She performs the uh, mandatory exercise test test, and QT doesn't shorten. So the QTC is 531. At this point, the sport physician, smart enough to recognize the phenomenon, sends the girl to us. We did the genotyping, and she was not surprisingly found to have a QT1. So the ST depression is now in the screen? Mm, yeah, it's now, I, I would say so, minimal and certainly not significant. Uh, OK, so we wanted to actually quantify the phenomenon. And what we have here is the percentage of QT that uh, is shortened by each 100 milliseconds shortening in the ROE. <coughs> That means that if you have a value of zero, there is absolutely no shortening in the QT when heart rate goes up. And if you have a high value, then this would mean that you are very able to shorten your QT. Now, first thing we did was to look at a bunch of controls to have an idea about what is the normal trend. And as you see, normal individuals have approximately 5% QT shortening for each 100 millisecond shortening their are and the LQT1 patients, even though they had a lot of overlap, clearly there is a group of them <coughs> an impaired ability to shorten. And this is in contrast to the LQT2, and especially to the LQT3 people. This was a totally unexpected finding with Joram uh, and I discussed uh, uh, for a long time. And indeed, he was able to find a possible explanation. But in any case, the point here is that these individuals uh, when they run, they shorten the QT. Yeah. So based on this, uh, what type of inferences would one make? Well, I would expect these individuals to be especially at risk during the exercise. And probably these individuals, well, not to make a hypothesis, it's easy one has to test it, and we did that in uh, this cooperative study. Again, as you see, a bunch of names, and we were able to put together 670 patients of known genotype and all with symptoms. So once again, we had the big numbers that were allowing us to draw conclusions. And I'm just showing you this slide of the individuals who had cardiac arrest of sudden death, 110. What we did was to look for the conditions under which these events occur, exercise, emotion, or sleep and rest without arousal. 
if you look at the FUT1 individuals, you see that practically the uh, vast majority, 75% of them, did die during uh, 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 exercise. And this is exactly, if you remember one of my very first flights, exactly what's happening to most of these people, and 15% for a total of 90 during emotions. Let's move now to the NQT3. You see the opposite pattern here. 80% of them die of cardiac arrest while they are asleep. I mean, this, I think, is, is a rather shocking thing. And initially, we couldn't figure it out. And it became clear only in the moment we were able to dissect the various genes. And the MQT2 type is very similar to this. The arrows point to the fact that there was 0 or 5% major events during exercise. And I remember when I was preparing this manuscript, and you have to write, and I like to try to interpret what I see, I was puzzled because I, I was asking myself, what do these people have in common? These are individuals with mutation on the IKR current. These are individuals with mutations on the sodium current. What do they have in common? What do they have in common is that they have a normal IKS. And having a normal IKS, they can shorten their QT during exercise. And that is why they are not at risk while they are running. Swimming turns out to be a very specific uh, condition. Taking all the events, uh, including syncope, during swimming, 99% occurred in NQT1 patients, which means that uh, from a practical standpoint, if you are visiting someone with a long QT and you ask when they ended the faint, fainting episodes and they say it was while swimming, you can almost bet it's going to be an NQT1. By contrast, auditory stimuli are very typical for NQT2 patients. These are patients uh, who are suddenly called by a telephone in the night, uh, an alarm clock, uh, woke up by the mother, go to school, go to school. <laughs> they drop dead. <laughs> no, sorry, I, mean, I shouldn't say to sing, but, but that is more or less of what happens. And the point is that many of these are actually true tragedies. So this leads me to gene-specific therapy. In the moment you begin to know what are the conditions that are especially dangerous for one genetic subgroup, then you can begin to think what is the best uh, uh, treatment. And the other thing is, since beta blockers have always been used successfully in this population, the first question I had was how effective or, or ineffective are beta blockers according to the different genotypes. And uh, I'll show you a couple of slides here. This was the first evidence. It comes from this study uh, of the 670 uh, patients uh, uh, and shows to you that 4% uh, uh, of NQT1, this was based on the 271 patients on beta blocker therapy for, for whom we knew exactly what, what did happen. And all of them were symptomatic. 4% of NQT1 and NQT2 had either cardiac arrest or sudden death. Uh, importantly, the NQT2 only had cardiac arrest, none of them done. This group here is NQT3, and this was the first suggestion that for the NQT3 patients, beta blockers may not be sufficient. Uh, in this other study with Mike Vincent, uh, we put together uh, three centers uh, with a high referral rate. Uh, they were all NQT1, 157, 73% with symptoms. The average follow-up was very long, 12 years, which is important in, uh, in allowing you to be certain about your implication. Look at the incidence of combined cardiac arrest and sudden death, 1.2%. Uh, Bruce and I were discussing earlier on uh, management of NQT1, and my point is that based on these data in NQT1 patients, I can say that very seldom is an NQT1 patient who has only had symptoms or even worse if it's symptomatic, need an ICP. These patients can be managed very well by beta blockers. Uh, this is a more recent study uh, that I've conducted with Silvia Priori. 335 uh, uh, genotype patients, half of them with symptoms. If you look at the NQT1, with the breakdown between sudden death and cardiac arrest, is 106. Again, pointing to the fact that the NQT1 patients do respond extremely well to beta blockers. 
for the FQT2 subtype, the incidence is higher, closer to 7%, but again, as in the other study, only cardiac arrest, no sudden death. I don't know why, I don't want to attach ex excessive importance, but this means that beta blockers are very effective also in FQT2 patients, a little bit less than in FQT1. And again, there is a significant amount of failures, especially in terms of sudden deaths, with the FQT3 patients. So this is again pointing to the fact that beta blockers, I believe, are helpful, but not enough for the FQT3 subtype. And as I showed to you data on the Gervais lung units, the patients, these are uh, totally new data. Uh, we had information in terms of therapy on 92 uh, of them, 75 with symptoms when they started therapy, and the combined incidence of sudden death and cardiac arrest is unacceptably high, 27%. And again, keep in mind that the average age of these patients is three, four, five years. So clearly, beta blockers are not sufficient. And, and I must say, I was not expecting this, quite frankly. I, I knew that they were more severe than the others, uh, but still, before seeing the numbers, the actual numbers, I was not expecting such a failure. So based on this, one can draw some conclusions. And for LGT1 patients, our conclusion is that beta blockers are highly effective. Sympatectomy, even if I didn't show the data here, is highly effective. They obviously should avoid competitive sports and stable <coughs> exercise, and swimming should be allowed under adult supervision, provided that the adults can swim. <laughs> I mean, I have to add this because it's not enough to have an adult there. You need someone who can jump in the pool. Um, for LGT2 patients, beta blockers are reasonably effective. Uh, one should really avoid loud noises, alarm clocks, in the nighttime telephone in the bedroom. Whenever I showed this slide, I also added that if one talks in terms of gene-specific therapy, the idea in general is that gene-specific therapy is a highly sophisticated type of medicine. <laughs> but simply by removing the telephone from the bedroom is gene-specific therapy. It's gross, but it is gene-specific. And these patients are very sensitive to their potassium level, so one should be careful in always having a high potassium level. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. There's loud noises, that, that's a sympathetic uh, stimulus, right? Yes. So is, is that differentiated between the ones who are on beta blockers and those who are not? Yeah, Do they sense. still die with loud noises if they're on beta blockers? Because surely Well, yeah, but you know, beta blockers don't provide a 100% block. I, I mean, it's, uh, so you, you are reducing it. As a matter of fact, only 6 7% of them are in trouble. So with, in medicine, I mean, you, you okay. go for shifting things toward okay. low values. I mean, the zero is uh, But they do still get a, it is still a beta response that's causing this. Yes, effect. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, the, the characteristic here is the startle. I mean, it's really a startling effect. Uh, so it's not something that builds up. It's uh, uh, when something happens, if I make a sudden noise and you are not expecting that. I mean, that's why the, the bell ringing uh, on the door, I mean, the telephone is, uh, and especially when, when it is not anticipated. But if they've been sympathectomized, would that get rid of it? It decreases it, but it does not provide full protection. Again, keep in mind, it's sympathetic and very good in the nerves only on the yeah, left it's side. still circulating. Well, well, you have circulating and you have those on the right, which are not contributing much to, to the ventricle, but still some. So again, we are, one is reducing uh, things. Okay. For the LGT3 patients, as you see, the long list is longer. And whenever you see a long list in terms of management, that means we don't know what to do or we don't know it very well. The truth of the matter is that beta blockers are only partially effective. Sympatectomy seems very effective, but the numbers we have are small. One certainly has to consider an ICD. Maxillatine is interesting because in almost half of the patient produces a major shortening of the QT interval, and that in combination with the anterior therapies may be very useful, but we have had failures as well. One should consider, especially for children, we have at home an automatic external defibrillator because most of these events, as I showed to you, occur when the patient dies. And uh, I, I begin to, inc to increasingly think of the possible value of bedroom sharing. Uh, I don't have time to discuss the reason for that. If anyone is interested, we will give for the discussion. So don't ask me the question now. Uh, but it's an interesting, con it's an interesting concept, but uh, I'll keep it for the discussion. For the Gervais-Langenitz syndrome, 
I reached the conclusion that beta blockers are insufficient. We have to implant an ICD whenever it's feasible, and uh, I suggest we use a sympatectomy as a bridge therapy to the ICD. The pacemaker thing probably is not working. Now let me shift the gears once again and uh, talk for a few moments about low penetrance, which in this disease has major importance. Now, what is penetrance? I mean, most of you know, but penetrance represents the percentage of gene carriers showing the phenotype of the disease, and low penetrance implies a low sensitivity of clinical diagnosis, which means many false negatives. For a long time, penetrance has been thought to be very high in the long period syndrome, ranging between 90 and 100 percent. And this implied that most cardiologists were confident that they could make the diagnosis simply based on the electrocardiogram. Um, 25 years ago, I, I was a very young man, and I, I did propose, uh, uh, without winning many prizes, that uh, purely on speculative grounds, the spectrum of long period syndrome might have been larger than previously thought and might have included a normal cutinula. And I remember when I presented that, it was not well received. I mean, the idea of the long kidney syndrome with the normal cutinula didn't go down very well. And it did, did take some time before we could prove it. This was in 1999. What we did at this point, we identified the number of families in whom we put the genotype, one, one person in the family, and this was the only person in the family showing the disease based on the ECG. And then, uh, and then we looked to the whole family story and to the mutations. So in this family, for instance, there was one sudden death. This was the only person showing a long QT on BCG. And again, based on clinical diagnosis, you would have said that this is a long QT syndrome patient and everyone else don't have it. But with the molecular diagnosis, we recognize these individuals as mutation carriers. This is a major thing because these individuals here, even if they have a normal QT interval and the four are at lower risk of developing events, cannot be regarded as totally free of risk, and they can become at extremely high risk if they lose potassium or if they are treated with one of the many, even non-cardiovascular drugs that block the IKR coverage. Therefore, the low penetrance in long the syndrome carries major conceptual consequences. On one hand, it points to the existence of silent gene of mutation carriers, uh, which affects the concept of the prevalence of the disease. But it has also medical consequences. It has medical legal implications. Because by not making the diagnosis, one fails to notify risk. So if we see a family and someone, some of the siblings have a normal QT, and we tell the parents that they don't have the long kidney syndrome without having proven it uh, with genotyping, there is a possibility for the siblings to receive uh, many of the uh, antibiotics, antihistaminics, you name it, many of the drugs that block IKR, and that these may lead to a sudden point and sudden death. Uh, that is why, in my opinion, uh, genotyping is no longer a research tool. It has to be regarded as an essential part of clinical management. And of course, because there is an hidden risk whenever these patients are exposed to these conditions. Okay, now I'm changing again and going to modify your genes. One of the issues that has always fascinated me with this disease is why is it that individuals that are affected by the disease in the same family, some of them die, some of them may have a syncope in some they remain asymptomatic for life. Uh, my interest stems from the fact that, uh, again, as I run a CCU, uh, I know that 5% uh, of patients with acute myocardial infarction will develop sudden death and trigger fibrillation in the first few hours and will never make it to the hospital. Why is that? It's not because of the science of the infant. I always assume that there is something else that is acting, and personally I believe is a greater release of catecholamines, such that that acute myocardial infarction or that ischemic episode translates into a trick of relation in certain individuals and not in others. And this really is the basis to think in terms of modifier genes. But if one wants to really approach and attack the issue of modifier genes, you need a good human model. And I think we found such a good model. And this goes back in <coughs> history, in a sense. 
because it was about year 1670 that the Dutchman left the Netherlands, went to South Africa, and he was affected by long syndrome, APT1 to be specific. The diagnosis was not made in those days. And uh, during the following 330 years, his genes traveled extensively. His mutation A341V is now present in many South African families. And uh, with my partner, Paul Brink, at the Stellenbosch University, we identified uh, 22 families descending directly from the Dutchman to Compton syndrome. All the affected individuals carry the same identical mutation on the SAMQ1 gene. And this clearly is offering uh, a fantastic opportunity because we can make a number of studies in these families. We have the no mutation carriers as controls, and then we have the mutation carriers. And among the mutation carriers, we can look at the symptomatics and those without symptoms. And as a matter of fact, what we began to do a few years ago, we are supported by NIH in this, and Al George is my partner in the study, Al George in Nashville. Uh, we are doing uh, in all these patients a number of autonomic tests, by reflex sensitivity, team table, alter recording, you name it, the whole lot. Let me show you uh, some of this, uh, of this data. The first manuscript was just published uh, three weeks ago in circulation. Uh, and uh, let me also add that this is one of the two founder populations in the world. One is in South Africa, one is in Finland. Uh, by, by founder population, I mean founder population on this gene, I mean affecting the IPS carry. And now we are, we are developing a partnership with the Finnish group, so we are going to use that for validation. Now this is, uh, uh, I mean, we had a genealogist uh, working with us, and uh, we identified the couple from which all the affected people descend, <coughs> and one of their parents clearly was a person affected, uh, and uh, uh, you may note his name here. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't make it up. I mean, this is the Dutch spelling of Peter Schwartz. I mean, I, I, I wanted to put it in the manuscript, as a matter of fact, but then wrote an objective and say that it was too much, that the reviewers have been upset. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't put it in the manuscript, but uh, I, I must say I was quite impressed when I saw it. <laughs> Next to me, it must exist. Anyway, this is a uh, QTC distribution between the non-carriers and the carriers. Now the point I want to make here is that if having exactly the same mutation, you would expect in theory this individual to have the same loss of IKS carry. If that were true, they should have had a very similar QTC. Look what's happening. You go from individuals with normal values to <coughs> individuals up to 600, almost 700 milliseconds. So there is an extremely wide range of the other thing, as I said, was that we are trying to study to compare those with symptoms to those without symptoms, because I'm trying to find out if we can identify a genetic background that may explain why certain individuals with this mutation do not develop symptoms. And I was growing uh, more and more upset with my own people, because any time we were checking data, the number of asymptomatic people was small. And at one point, I start yelling at them. I say, get the asymptomatics. We can't make a comparison if there are few. And they said, we look, we look, we look. But they were not finding them. And the reason is that the <coughs> people working with me, they did whatever they could. But the reality is that the very vast majority of patients with this mutation is asymptomatic, 80% of them. And this was striking, because if you look to the Population 355 of LQT1 with mutations everywhere that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, you see what a striking difference that is. <coughs> this mutation is clearly associated with a very high risk of developing symptoms. So I couldn't blame my people. And 80% get an attack before puberty, so why is it disappeared? Why? Why what? Why haven't they died out? Well, you don't die necessarily. I mean, you, you have a syncope. That's not death. I mean, the natural history is that you have an arrhythmic episode. And as a matter of fact, most of the time, you, go, you, you come back. Then you may have another one, another one, and some well, time, some won't. They weren't treated over the last 300 years, were Well, but again, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't all die. I mean, it's, uh, okay. it's, uh, okay. it's not incompatible with life. Okay. 
and uh, some of them are symptomatic before they can generate cost. You need to send me for an internship so you know which question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I could leave, I could leave. <laughs> no, we're just getting used to some things. We, so. we also wanted to make sure that uh, uh, it was not uh, the difference in the, in the T curves here is not due to the fact that we think this population many had borderline normal QTs, even if they were all genotyped. So we repeated the analysis, looking at females only, because they were the larger group, all with a QTC greater than 500. And even here, clearly, this mutation is associated with a much higher risk for events. And as a matter of fact, when you put the data with numbers, to find out that comparing, in a sense, a sort of worldwide population, <coughs> cardiac events in 30% against 79%. The age, seven years versus 13. The disease clearly longer, for 90 versus 466. And most important, the percentage of side mutation carriers much lower, 7% versus 36%. We also made uh, another unexpected observation on which we're working extensively now, uh, we looked at the heart rate of these individuals and their QTC, and here this value of 73 represents the upper tertiary. So you have one third of the patients above 73 beats per minute and two thirds in this area. But if you look to the not many asymptomatic patients, they clearly cluster in this area. So we came to the unexpected observation that those individuals who at baseline tend to have a lower heart rate we are at lower risk. And as a matter of fact, if you look to the tear times of heart rate, you see that the probability of having events goes from 50 to 90% according to the baseline heart rate. And we have already confirmed this data in the Finnish population I mentioned to you shortly ago. So this again is an unexpected finding that we had. And of course now we are screening these individuals for mutations or polymorphisms on many of the genes involved in the neural control of cardiac function. Okay, another thing in terms of modifiers, it is a slightly different story, uh, paper that came out in uh, end, of, end of August. Um, everything started in a fairly trivial way. There was a lady, 45 years old, she had syncope since age 20. <coughs> Before Christmas, she lost, she lost consciousness while sitting in a car. Now, her husband was driving, and uh, immediately you say, well, maybe being in Italy was going very, very fast. No, it was not going fast. Uh, and even if it were a husband and wife, they were not arguing. So it was a peaceful situation. And nonetheless, <laughs> she had, uh, well, one reviewer answered that. Uh, the trigger fibrillation was documented in, in, uh, in the emergency room. Uh, she was resuscitated. Everything was normal. From the Flecker and I test, the diagnosis at that point was an idiopathic ventricular fibrillation, and she was implanted with an ICD and set home. And in all these patients, I do molecular screening, and uh, uh, a few months later, people from the lab came back to me and said, Hey, we found the mutation on her. This is a long QT2 patient. I said, Oh my God, I mean, somehow we missed it. So I said, Who didn't see the ECG properly? So we looked at the ECG. I said, she was actually normal, so I mean, I couldn't fault my people. So we called back this lady, repeated uh, a number of halters, and true enough, sometimes during the halter, you could see these things, very long PT appearing throughout the day in bifasic, but she also had a normal PT. So it's this variability of the QT that clearly indicated she had the long QT, but was not such to produce a long QT all the time. This is the pedigree, and of course, this is the mutation, A116V, and uh, we realized there were other members in the family, so we genotyped everyone. We realized that this lady, in addition to this uh, mutation, also had a common polymorphism, k 18 on the other allele. So we looked at the entire family, and we realized that a number of them had either the mutation or the polymorphism, never together. The only person having both of them together was the one with cardiac arrest. And we started wondering if there might have been an implication. Now, this polymorphism is one of the most common. It's present in 30% of Caucasians. So if you count how many we are, a bunch of us will have this polymorphism. So in order to figure out what was happening with Al George, we uh, did an expression study. 
and the mutation, as you see, uh, produces a reduced currents, uh, both activating and tail currents are reduced. And uh, if you look at the uh, tail currents here, it's clear that uh, the mutation reduces the current, but also this polymorphism reduces the current a little bit. But the point, of course, is that our patient, uh, not only at this, but also at the mutation on one allele and the polymorphism on the other. So we did a co-expression study. And uh, if you look, I think this is the best part to look at, you see that co-expressing either the uh, um, polymorphism or the mutation with the wild type, you had very moderate losses in current. But when the two were co-expressed together, this is what you found. So to our complete surprise, this very common polymorphism is able to exaggerate the electrophysiological effect of this mutation. And our conclusion was that this very common polymorphism may indeed modify the clinical expression of a latent entity to mutation. And the implication, I believe, is important. I do believe that the implication goes well beyond wrong decision because similar genetic oops, well, similar genetic mechanism may contribute to the risk for sudden death in more prevalent cardiac diseases. Not this one polymorphism, but others. I mentioned earlier sudden death in occurrence of acute myocardial infarction, but think of heart failure. How many patients in class two die suddenly and unexpectedly? And you all know that uh, in the heart failure, you have a loss of potassium currents and dependence for particular location. It's not uh, out of the imagination to, to think that if these patients, on top of everything else, also have a reduced potassium current because one of these polymorphisms, these may create a very significant situation. So I believe, in, to conclude this part, and then I have only two slides to show you, uh, that the finding that this common polymorphism can alter significantly the uh, uh, electrophysiological impact of that mutation is important because it opens up uh, the possibility that many other mechanisms exist for more common conditions. And uh, I will conclude with a couple of slides on prevalence. I mentioned earlier that what you find in textbooks is totally unwarranted, um, mostly because it's, it's a statement made by well-meaning people but without any data. So how did we arrive to an estimate? It all goes back to this hypothesis that I presented in 1976. It was actually my first NH grant submitted in 1974. Uh, that sudden infant death syndrome, you know, sudden infant death syndrome is first, probably the most important cause of death in the Western world in, in the first year of life. Uh, what I proposed at the time was that a certain number of seats, uh, unknown number of seats, could be due to lethal but preventable cardiac arrhythmia, possibly related to the long syndrome. That was very controversial, especially pediatricians didn't like it a bit, and uh, um, because the apnea hypothesis was the dominant one. And of course, I had to test it, and it was not an easy thing, because how can you test such a hypothesis? In my opinion, the only way to test it was to record an ECG in a bunch of infants and follow them prospectively. But the question is, how many? I thought that was a large number was necessary. So we started 33,000 neonates. Since I had no funding in those days, it took me 18 years to do this stuff. And uh, I didn't mind because I was doing other things. At the same time. And uh, eventually we had 24 cases of sudden infant death. 12 of them had a QPC exceeding two standard deviations to involve the normal. This didn't prove at all that the long QPC syndrome was involved, but it did demonstrate for the first time that the prolongation of the QT, the value the on day three, four of life was associated with a significantly higher risk. Actually, the risk increased by 41 times. Following that, we had two, in a sense, lucky events, serendipitous uh, findings, because in, uh, uh, here we were able to prove uh, the first molecular link between long syndrome and SIDS. There was an uh, infant who had a, an episode of uh, apnea, cyanosis, and uh, with documented VF in the hospital, we found that the novel mutation on CNN5A, and this again was the proof of concept that uh, uh, a mutation related to the long syndrome could cause a sudden death in an infant. 
and uh, the following year we were able in a dead infant uh, who was diagnosed as SIDS with all the typical features of SIDS, we found the KCNQ1 de novo mutation and the same mutation is present in one of the many families with the syndrome that we are following. So this of course uh, uh, confirmed the hypothesis but we had to quantify how many cases of SIDS can reasonably be ascribed to uh, mutations in blocking syndrome genes. To do that, we carried out and just completed a, a study in a collaboration with the group in Norway. Uh, we received from them DNA of, from 201 SIDS cases. Uh, we also had uh, uh, 200 controls. Uh, we made a blind analysis. 24 mutations were found on blocking syndrome genes. But after looking for the functional effects, our conclusion is that 17 of them are likely cause or were likely causes of the sudden deaths for an 8.4%. Now, if you keep in mind that if you take 100 patients with the long term syndrome, in 30% of them you won't find mutations, uh, my assumption is that this number is probably a bit higher, and I believe that probably 10% of sudden infant deaths are actually due to this mechanism. Now, this raises a very important practical question because SIDS has always been regarded not only as an unexpected but not preventable. But if you die because of long term syndrome, that is preventable if you make the diagnosis. And this clearly raises the issue of ACG screening in the first month of life. This is something I've been talking about for 15, 20 years, and uh, uh, again, not a very popular idea. Um, but uh, I'm rather stubborn, as well as Europe. <laughs> we have our thing that we don't drop easily. And uh, um, I went on with this. I actually uh, discussed it with the Italian Ministry of Health. And based on the evidence we had, uh, uh, it was ready to become, uh, to, uh, to enter as a law in the country. Then we had the change in government, and we discussed things with the new Minister of Health. And they said, well, it's all fine, the data there, but we really need a pilot study. We need to see the feasibility, we need to see the cost, we need to see how many you find. As a matter of fact, I found that pretty reasonable. So I asked the minister, how many do you want? 50,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> questions? Okay, Marie. may I go first? Um, what, what do you, there's been criticism of QTC as a way of looking at uh, repolarization of abnormality. How, what is your opinion about that? Should we, we be looking at QT dynamicity? And do you think if that were feasible, would that be a better marker? For you know, I, I'm very simple-minded, and uh, uh, QT is certainly a gross measure. There's no doubt about it. Clinically, it's been proven very, very useful time and time over again. So I wouldn't use very sophisticated ways of assessing something that is that clinical you, do, you have to do in many ways. We are also looking to uh, uh, change this in QT according to uh, the RR interval changes. That may provide additional information. I'm certainly not discounting at all the measurement of the QT. In our first newborn study, I, my concern was that the QTC correction that one has to make uh, might have been offset by the fast heart rate of the infants. And uh, for that reason, we took 4,000 of our normal healthy newborns. We measured five beats uh, uh, in all of them, uh, which meant 20,000 beats. We measured the RR interval, and we measured the QT without any correction. So we created normative values in terms of 97.5%. Okay, so you created your own QTC. Exactly. And uh, now then we, we measured that QT independently of heart rate, practically. And what we found in the study was that the 12 victims where the long QTC also had a QT exceeding the 97.5 percentile. So that was very reassuring. So the bottom line is that uh, uh, we measured the QTC knowing the limitations. I, I once wrote in, uh, in uh, Doug Zipes textbook that I don't measure the QT anymore. I look at it, which of course was a provocation, but because morphology is so important, um, but practically, you have to measure it, of course. And uh, I'm not swayed by 440, 450, or even 460. But you have 470, and that is confirmed. In all our, our kids, whenever we find the value over 470, the families inform they come back within a week, they repeat it. 
and again, if it has normalized or if it is a normal value, we, we, we follow in a different way. But if it is confirmed twice, greater than 470, I have no doubt that we are dealing with an abnormal condition. Very, very exciting point. I wanted to make a comment on current ICD therapy. Would you recommend a uh, patient with one QD3 they all should be in ICD? And how safe are they? And last year there were several cases we went through the program with ICD therapy uh, and the manufacturer called the devices. That's a very important question. But the first thing I believe personally, and that's my personal attitude, uh, these decisions cannot be the responsibility solely of the physician. I spend a lot of time discussing with either the patients or their families according to their age, extensively. I mean, I spend hours talking with them in the pro and cons, because we don't have a crystal ball. I can never say this is 100% right. This, the best I can say is what I would do if your daughter would be my daughter. That is the best I can do. And then I base that, of course, on the data we have and the actual evidence. Now, for LQT, let oh, me start with the general question about the ICDs. Uh, there is an excessive use of the ICDs. Uh, if there has been a cardiac arrest, there is no question, as I said, then that's the first thing we do as well. Uh, my concern is that very often ICD is implanted uh, for the safety of the physician, not for the safety of the patient. Because in the moment you've implanted an ICD and something happens, you put in an ICD, no one is going to see you. Uh, wherever if you don't and something bad happens, then you're liable. But this is not good medicine. I think you have to judge in the specific cases what is the best option. You have to consider the age of the patient, the genetic subtype, the probability of a lethal event. And then you've got to discuss it. Because someone will say, I don't want to hear anything else, I want to have an ICD because I want to be quiet. Of course, there are a number of problems, as you've mentioned, especially in children. And I have a number of horror stories. Uh, kids, uh, I mean, one of the kids who died in a cerebral hyperthermia because he had a shock on his chest. He was shocked hundreds of times before they could disconnect everything, and he died. And this kid was asymptomatic. He had been implanted because his brother had died suddenly. So, and there's plenty of, of these awful things. Nonetheless, the ICDs can be very useful. So the question is to find out where. As I said earlier, for LTT1 patients, I think that is almost never necessary to the MCT because they can be treated very well between beta blockers and single The LTT3, coming to your question, is of course a more difficult thing. That is a difficult thing. And uh, um, if they are asymptomatic, no, I wouldn't put in an ICD. If they are symptomatic, uh, uh, I would consider that I always do left sympathectomy because with left sympathectomy also we can shorten the QTC by 40 milliseconds. So that means that we are not only acting on the triggers, but we are acting on the substrate. And that, that's important for really. um, There are these other things that we do, like uh, having either the intercolon or an adult sleeping with the kids if they, they're young. Um, Mexilatine I tried because in 50% of the cases we have a great shortening in the QTC and that is uh, of additional value. So I try uh, to give them with beta blockers, uh, maxillotin and sympathectomy, uh, but it depends also on the QTC. If the QTC is more than 520, 530, and then we left the The good thing is that only 10% of the genotype patients are in QTC, so it's a small number. Hi, um, I'm one of the uh, four electrophysiologists, pediatric electrophysiologists in the state of Missouri, so we have sort of a lonely job. Um, how do you manage the borderline QT patient? You know, the vignette that you presented is a no-brainer. Nobody should have missed that. And yeah. It's a tragedy that it was. But we get the story of somebody in the emergency room, had albuterol, has asthma, had some chest pain, got an EKG, the corrected QT interval is 470, 480. And it really is 470 to 480. You see them in clinic, you get another EKG, it's 450, 460. The T-wave morphology is not particularly provocative. They've never had a symptom a day in their life. And they're coming to you for sports clearance prior to football season. Yeah, this is the worst type, especially. <laughs> but this, this is true. I mean, this is and up a, until a year or two, we were even, even they did, uh, of, of these kids who do well in sport with the family, hoping that they are becoming the great athlete, and all of a sudden, uh, long QT is found. Um, okay. Now, of course, the big distinction is uh, if there is or no history of safety. I mean, that, that's a big divide because. 
if you have a history of syncope and a long QT, you have to act as it is a pressure problem. What we do is a very careful and very sensitive family history, looking at these trees as well. Uh, we do a lot of fault tests in these kids because, as I showed in that case, sometimes uh, you don't see too much on the baseline tracing and you see things happening at uh, night time especially that can be very informative. We do an exercise stress test not to elicit the rhythms, which we never do, we never see, but to see if there is a lack of shortening of the QD. We do, in all these borderline cases, now we do genotyping. Um, some of them, uh, even uh, though they have borderline uh, tracings in their symptomatics <coughs> are mutation carriers. So we, those we find. Once we have a certainty, then of course we will proceed. Sometimes the lab is negative, so we cannot genotype it. The QT remains 470, 480, as you say, and, and that makes it very difficult. At that point, probably we make a lot of mistakes in whatever we say. Um, at that point, one has to be to play safe for them. So if you have a long QT, sports is out, as I'm concerned. And, and, and on the one hand, it's not that's not a subjective choice in, in, in our country, at least, because uh, they would they need to get this permission that I mentioned earlier, and they would never get it. Because with the QDC in exceeding 470, no matter what, if uh, they can, if an explanation is not found, the suspicion remains that they have uh, a unclear case of long term syndrome, the kid will not do competitive sports, period. That's a lot. So that at least I don't have to think about. Um, but these are the difficult cases in the game. We all have to know that we can we can we can guess. We can guess. Yeah. That's one of our limitations. I've taken to using the uh, QT scoring system which bears your name uh, to sort of risk stratify these patients. Three or four points on the, on the Schwartz score. I'll make the diagnosis and throw the book out of the room in their life. At zero to one, I will often you know, let them go. And at two, I'll sort of hand them the list of medications and say, consider this your electrical allergy and call me if you ever have Of course, of course. But you have to consider all these possibilities. And you have to see them again. And uh, there will be a, an intermediate period of time in which you don't know exactly. But this is part of medicine. I mean, I think that we all have to accept that uh, more often than not, we don't have the right answers. Is SIDS that was prevalent? surprising, we're keeping quiet. Yeah, I've been waiting. <laughs> is SIDS prevalent in one QT families? Not very much. Why not? Of fact, it's but it, it, it is. I mean, you have it. Not very often. And uh, I don't think there's ever been uh, a good answer with uh, one exception. In the uh, Norwegian study, the one we did, the prevalence of the mutation is CNN 5A mutation. So these may be lethal mutations, those that kill very early on may be lethal mutations, so you don't have development and there's and these dies out. So I think they're always found the mutations. Well, these are different. actually, most of them are the normal mutations. Yeah, the ones that yeah. So, um, and now we are battling with the Norwegian government to change a law to allow us to break the anonymity code from mm -hmm. these cases. Our reasoning is that if there are siblings alive with who are carriers of the mutations, we may save their life. Their life. We have tried to do that. And then we find out how many of these were the normal mutations. So the de novo mutations that were found, you had one in SCN5A and, and one, one in KBM. KBM. So when those are looked at in recombinant expression, are they very severe loss of function mutations? Did, uh, well, uh, the, the acute one was not expressed, but it was present in another family. The CNN5A was expressed because otherwise it was not really recent, it was published. And uh, it, it, I, I don't remember the details. I mean, it, it had a significant uh, Persistent rate current. I cannot quantify it. Is the data you show about the heart rate include the pediatric group? No, 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 of course not. Uh, this was done in individuals. I don't remember if they were above age 15 or above age 18. Clearly, we stayed away from One more question, practical. Okay, yes. so you have to, you know, the data that you showed made me even more stressful now, okay, because. If you can come to the clinic up to syncope and you have completely normal QT, and you definitely, if you do it two weeks later, and you see all the difference, uh, what should be our approach now? So everyone would come to the clinic with, you know. I feel sorry about it. I, mean, I, I, will not show, I will not show it again. 
No, 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 I mean, listen, it, it is important, and of course I believe that this is an odd case in a sense. Uh, I think that if you have someone coming in with syncope for whatever reason, one 24 hour order has to be done. Uh, that's informative in, in, any, in any case. So that, I think that's a useful thing to do. And if you don't see anything there, then, then you're not wrong. There's also bad luck in life if you try to, to give with that. Um, Again, families, I mean, the other point is that if you really have a normal uh, QT, the probability of having events related to that is small. Now, this was, I believe, I'm a rather acceptable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, again, you know, these are other cases, and uh, I don't think one should be too much about them. But it's important to keep in mind that these are possibilities. So look into the private. The important thing is never forget. Look at the family and have a Peter, about the morphology of the T wave that you showed. Well, I see the knots that you're talking about. I think of two T waves, T1 and T2. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I see T1, T2, T3, or U. And I think that's actually an estimation of, of uh, inhomogeneous QT. So, if your patients all had uniform QT prolongation, let's say a 15 to 20 percent in homogeneity, would they still have the rhythm? Well, you see, it varies a lot because if you look to the LQT1 subtype, most of them tend to have a rather homogeneous, a markedly prolonged but homogeneous T wave. This pattern, with this double notch of T1, T2, as you say, um, it's more common in the LQT2 subtype. Um, very recently, I got some data back from China where we go from time to time to do surgery with the Chinese patients and to teach the Chinese surgeon on how to do sympatectomy. Um, that analyzing uh, um, the TU complex after surgery became clear that many of the patients had a clear cut separation between T and U wave because of the shortening of QT. So then the T3, as the said, of U wave uh, becomes more, more manifest. Um, I wouldn't want to speculate too much on the nature of that, uh, but uh, what uh, I, I do mentally, I associate these patterns with increase, uh, increased electrical instability, mm. and that, that worries me in the Any other questions? So, so with the, uh, the drug part forms, uh, do they show the same kind of uh, symptomatology that the LTT? Uh, Sorry, I missed the beginning. The drug acquired forms, so uh, yeah. IKR blockers. So, yeah. they, so nighttime uh, alarm. Has anybody done that study to see if those patients or the people that actually died show symptoms of you know that I don't the general uh, uh, I don't know if anyone, in terms of the drug induced uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. pattern, yeah. looked uh, at specific triggers. I think no one did it. It's a very good question, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's certainly not associated with stress or exercise, for all I know. And uh, my tentative answer would be that probably it occurs throughout the day, um, but I don't know, and, and I'll try to look it up. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Peter, again. Thank Take you. Care,